picture. I can man the slides for you. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, host lunch is tough, so thank you for showing up. <laughs> Uh, my name is Anisha Stana. I'm an engineering manager at OpenShift AI. Uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm a uh, software engineer also on OpenShift AI. And um, the third picture on here is of Antona Stefanuti. Um, I gave a similar talk at KubeCon earlier this year, which I've reused. Um, so yeah, today we'll be talking to you about the Kubernetes scheduler and um, why it doesn't quite meet all requirements you may have. Right? Um, Going in here, um, generally when you think of things running on Kubernetes, you think, you're thinking of like online services, right? Microservice architectures, you care about things like latency and availability. You're usually thinking in terms of pods. Pods are interchange interchangeable, right? You can just kill them, a new one comes up, you don't care. For the most part, they're stateless. You know, let's not talk about databases on Kubernetes. That is the kind of forms I do not want to touch. And when we think about scaling as well, it's pods, right? Oh, Greek forgot. Um, you just add new pods every time you need to scale up further. On the other side of the spectrum, you have something we call offline jobs. These are things like, you know, like your batch workloads, right? Like your really large scale training. Um, you know, you have hundreds, thousands of nodes. Um, these workloads are always stateful. If you have a training job running for 10 days and it dies on the ninth day, you want to make sure you're taking checkpoints as it was going along so that you don't lose nine days worth of training. Um, we generally think of these uh, things in terms of um, workers and like, nodes, right? Like at the size that you're operating at, a single pod is not that useful to consider. Um, and the main metrics we really care about here are throughput and efficiency. So um, what we did is we ran through some benchmarks with the Kubernetes scheduler, just the default thing running on your cluster. Right? Um, so what we did is um, we used something called Quark, which is Kubernetes without kubelet. It's a great way to sort of simulate actual Kubernetes clusters just on your laptop so you don't have to pay a bazillion dollars to do anything useful um, in terms of the actual scale test. Let's call it that. Um, we took 1,000 batch jobs. Each job has a parallelism factor of 10 pods. Um, the completion deadline is 15 minutes for these. And they usually, if it runs successfully, should take about three minutes to complete. Um, in terms of the cluster we're simulating, it has 100 nodes, I would say. Yes. 100 nodes with 1,000 gigs of memory and 1,000 CPUs on it. And if you were to just do the math based on the job um, requests as well as like what's available on the cluster, it should take about 10 minutes to finish all 1,000 jobs. So let's see what happened. Pretty bad, right? Um, you can see only 51% of our jobs are completed. And as the requests were coming in, as new jobs are created, Kubernetes basically immediately tried to create them. Um, Moreover, if you look over on the left side, you can see that we are greatly overcommitted in terms of how much CPU and memory we're requesting. Just looking at some metrics for the Kubernetes scheduler itself, you can see we're really abusing it, right? Like, lots of graphs in here, but like the key takeaway is that we had a ton of pod scheduling attempts. We had a lot of scheduling cycles. And if you look at the pending pods queue, Again, we have a lot of stuff just stu stuck there waiting that the Kubernetes scheduler is repeatedly trying to figure out where can I place these pods. Now, this talk is not about the Kubernetes scheduler. I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert in this space. Um, here's a link to a document, like a document outlining how this queuing unit works, and then, you know, just moreover, uh, you can find a lot more information online. So, the next thing we did was we said, okay, Default Kubernetes doesn't work well for us. Let's use something called the co-scheduler plugin. What the co-scheduler plugin um, gives us is gang scheduling capabilities, which basically lets Kubernetes know like, hey, I have a group of pods that are in a place at the same time, so don't schedule a pod unless you can schedule all, of, all the pods in this group. So 
I realize now that we may have made a small mistake with the slide. So, well, no, we'll go on. Yeah. So, um, what we did was we, is we also upped the parallelism factor on this. So, now instead of doing 1,000 jobs with 10 pods each, we do 100 jobs with 100 pods each. Theoretically, it should work much better, right? It's going to wait until all pods can be scheduled at the same time, then schedule them. You can see we ended up at 81% of our jobs having failed. Increasing the deadline uh, for completion to one hour does not get us that much. We still had 75% of the jobs failing. Again, you just kind of see in the metrics below, like, you know, again, stuff's not behaving well. Yeah. So this, this is actually a uh, limitation of the co-scheduling plugin. Uh, when you schedule a job, it uses a timestamp, uh, but it's only down to the last, like, second. Um, so, uh, based on the way it's implemented, don't ask me exactly how it works. I've read, read through the issue, um, but did not go through and, and figure out why it happens in code. But if you have two uh, jobs that are uh, basically admitted at the same exact time, um, they will try to schedule uh, and cause a, a deadlock between each other because um, they'll, they'll basically, for some reason, think that they're uh, both okay to schedule on the, the cluster. So what happens to that is you have pods spread throughout your nodes and not enough memory to schedule relevant pods. So going on. We were eventually able to get all the jobs to succeed, and to do that, we set the completion deadline to a really high number. Um, that being said, still not great because it took us three hours to complete it, which is like an order of magnitude more than the theoretical best number, right? We said that theoretically you should be somewhere around 10 minutes to finish all of these jobs given the resources you have. So clearly we can do a lot better, right? There has to be some solution. So this is where um, job schedulers, queuing systems can come in for you. We ran some benchmarks with queue, which is a project in Kubernetes that gives you sort of these job admission, scheduling, not scheduling, queuing capabilities. Next slide. Um, and again, going back to the original test case, right? You have 1,000 jobs, 10 pods each, 100% successful. Um, if you look at the memory commitments as well as the, res like the resource commitments, again, we never overcommit, which is great. Going on the next slide. Um, you can see also like in terms of these graphs, for the most part, the Kubernetes scheduler is a lot happier with us, right? Like it's not trying to repeatedly schedule pods again. It's not wasting cycles on like useless stuff. And one of the reasons for this is that Q is sitting in front of the Kubernetes scheduler and taking care of like job admission for you. Now, if you go back to the highly parallelized job, which had 100 pods, four job, 100 jobs, still done in 15 minutes, right? Fully green, right? You can see like we have jobs submit admit up till about the halfway point. We wait for some jobs to start succeeding. As they succeed, more and more stuff comes in. This is what we would ideally get from the Kubernetes scheduler, but again, that's not the behavior they wanted to optimize for. What they were focused on was kind of these online workloads. Um, next slide. So next up, Kevin is gonna go, go through some of the options you have. Um, there's a lot of projects out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the different projects that have kind of cropped up to solve this issue of uh, batch scheduling uh, queuing and um, quota management uh, in Kubernetes uh, because of this kind of gap in the uh, Kubernetes capabilities. Um, broadly speaking, uh, it can be broken down uh, into two separate categories. Uh, you have custom schedulers, <coughs> uh, which are meant to replace the default Kubernetes scheduler. Um, they will basically take on the queuing responsibility uh, the batch scheduling responsibility, as well as actually assigning uh, pods to nodes. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, you have uh, something like Q, uh, which actually acts as a controller sitting in front of the Kubernetes scheduler. Um, and it uses a uh, specific kind of uh, uh, contract uh, with uh, Kubernetes CRDs in order to um, basically not allow a, a resource to be um, scheduled by the, the Kubernetes scheduler until uh, resources become available. Um, so 
the, the first uh, project that I'll talk about um, is called Coordinator. Um, Coordinator uh, is a custom scheduler. Its goal is to basically uh, squeeze your, your cluster, squeeze resources out of your cluster. It will it has a um, daemon on it which monitors memory and CPU usage um, so that you can use uh, not just, uh, if, if you're, you, you can request beyond uh, your cluster's actual capacity by using uh, unused CPU and memory uh, on the cluster. So it'll, it'll monitor the, your, your uh, workload's actual usage uh, and use that reserve capacity to, to schedule some uh, workloads. Um, it allows for gang scheduling, uh, via, sorry, <laughs> uh, via something called uh, a pod group API. This requires the user to basically um, set a label in their pods um, in order to uh, join this pod group. And then when some min minimum number of pods can be admitted, then the whole pod group uh, will be admitted. Um, in terms of quota management, uh, it extends an existing uh, Kubernetes uh, scheduler plugin called uh, Elastic Quota API, uh, which is a uh, scheduler plugin that basically allows your namespace quotas um, to borrow unused resources from uh, other namespaces that aren't using their entire quota. Um, and then for, for some, like, uh, if you need to support uh, like extra dev devices like um, GPUs and stuff, it has its own device API. Um, so most of the time you'll, you'll be basically creating uh, pods and jobs like, uh, yeah. Next up, uh, you have the Volcano Scheduler. Uh, the Volcano Custom Scheduler, despite being a custom scheduler, it has um, its own kind of language for, for jobs and APIs. Uh, one benefit of this is that uh, the, uh, it provides some higher level um, abstractions for a lot of like uh, existing high performance compute and machine learning workloads like Kubeflow, uh, Ray, uh, Spark, or TorchX. Um, it provides all of the kind of queuing stuff that we want, uh, priority preemption, uh, first in, first out. Um, um, yeah, and it then also has this uh, idea of pod groups, um, and I think they're also um, tied in through uh, labels. Um, it relies on native extended resources for, for providing uh, device um, uh, support, and auto-scaling is by the uh, default cluster autoscaler via like overcommitment. Uh, if you overcommit, then the cluster will automatically scale up. Um, and uh, and then finally, for the custom schedulers, we have Unicorn. Uh, Unicorn is basically meant as a uh, drop-in replacement for the Kubernetes scheduler. Um, it comes with an admission webhook uh, that basically will take any uh, admitted workload. Uh, and then it will alter it so that it will use the unicorn scheduler. So you can disable this. Um, it's not kind of the, the design philosophy. The de design philosophy is that everything's going to be managed by unicorn. You're not going to use the Kubernetes scheduler anymore. Um, it works specifically on uh, pods uh, and uh, also has this uh, idea of task groups managed by um, uh, labels and whatnot. Uh, it does uh, priority preemption barring. Um, and does some uh, cool stuff ar around actual quota where it lets you uh, define a uh, quota tree um, where um, you can kind of have a hierarchical uh, quota where you have parents, children, uh, and then children can, can share resources uh, between one another. Um, and then for auto scaling, uh, it also does an, another uh, very cool thing uh, where it will reserve space on uh, auto-scaled uh, auto nodes by, um, uh, it, it'll re reserve space on auto-scaled nodes for the uh, workload that it was made for. 
um, via like basically fake pods that are uh, put onto those nodes. Um, currently, it does not uh, support any multi-cluster. Um, yeah. And then finally, uh, we have Q, which is kind of the, the black horse uh, of, of the bunch. Um, it kind of, it, as I said, does not uh, manage any of the actual, um, the uh, actual like putting pods on nodes. Uh, it sits in front of the uh, Kubernetes scheduler and uh, works using a specific um, field in a custom API called suspend. So it will basically, when a new workload is admitted, it will set the suspend field to false. Um, and any uh, resources that are, uh, any resources that are, um, managed by Q, Q will then basically decide when to unsuspend this job. Um, it, uh, so when, when you create this suspended job, it will, create a, um, it will create a workload that basically acts as a uh, gang submission uh, unit. Um, it provides some uh, resource sharing between uh, uh, children, so you have a cluster queue, which is like a parent uh, resource um, quota, and then you have uh, children. You can share between um, those children, but it's kind of just a two-level um, quota structure. Um, and then you also have the, uh, so because it's not handling actually putting uh, pods on nodes, um, it needs to kind of delegate to the uh, Kubernetes scheduler uh, information about node affinity and paint tolerations that would usually be handled by the uh, Kubernetes scheduler. So it has this uh, mapping of uh, nodes to a thing called resource flavors. Uh, resource flavors um, can basically uh, add paints and tolerations, basically giving you that ability to uh, schedule pods on uh, specific nodes. So it lets you kind of do scheduling without actually uh, handling the uh, placing of pods on uh, the nodes. Um, for auto scaling, because you have the uh, queue sitting in front of the kube scheduler, um, it's never going to over provision resources. Um, so you actually need, it has, a, it has to use a CA, CA provisioning request so that uh, res, uh, jobs within the queue. Uh, then we'll go um, and create the CA provisioning request so that when uh, so that it will scale up for um, a workload. Yeah, and it does have some multi-cluster support, but it's in very early stages, so uh, use at your own risk. Um, do you want to talk about uh, the? You can go to the next slide, but yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's the bulk of the talk itself. Now, um, you know, you probably guessed based on what we did our testing with and sort of how much detail Kevin went into. We went with Q for our use case. Um, the other set of schedulers, like the custom schedulers, are replacing the inbuilt Kubernetes scheduling behavior. And since we are working on a platform that we want to tell customers to install on their cluster, um, we'd be laughed out of the room if we asked them to say, yeah, like, get rid of that default Kubernetes thing, install this whole set of custom things. So. Right, kind of from the get-go, you know, going with any of them was, no, you can't do that. Some other real clear benefits of Q for us are that from an end user perspective, it's almost transparent, right? Like, if I was using something like Ray Cluster, if I was using Ray Clusters, if I was using training operator or just normal jobs, I can continue creating all the same stuff. I don't really need to update my code because Q can take care of most of that for me. The downside to that is that the engineers working on queue or on any of these custom controllers have to like manually build these integrations, but maybe that's our downside because you know we like writing code. Yeah. Most people do, so. Yeah, and Q actually uh, supports this idea of uh, cooperative preemption. So by giving control um, to these custom APIs, you can kind of let them decide how to um, suspend their jobs if there's some uh, uh, logic that needs to be done by a controller, um, which is also pretty nice. 
Yeah. So instead of a job, a training job just getting killed arbitrarily, the training job controller can actually ensure that it shuts down in a graceful manner and the checkpointing or whatever you need done happens. Um, that's it for most of our talk. So, I don't know, any questions? So I'm not familiar enough with this kind of stuff to understand, like, what is the install experience and, and setup experience for these kind of things is like, you know, in terms of like, you were talking about you get left out of the room for replacing the default scheduler. It's like, well, in order to add certain things to certain clusters, you have to have certain processes and approvals. So with Q, um, you're just installing CRDs and a new controller. DNC, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you're, you're installing sorry. a couple custom resource definitions and a new controller onto your cluster. It is, uh, it's really easy. Um, in terms of permissions, again, to create custom resources on a cluster, you do need elevated permissions, but it's still like um, not quite as impactful as, you know, okay, we're gonna install this thing that's gonna affect scheduling of every single pod on the cluster, right? With Q, um, it's restricted to specific resources. So OpenShift AI, we're working on an AI platform, so training, training resources. Um, and then this we're talk- also, yeah, We're also working on OpenShift, so, so replacing the, the Kubernetes scheduler, I assume, uh, we'll kind of put it in a unsupported, uh, it won't be supported to, to use your own custom scheduler. In OpenShift, uh, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I've, I've, I've kind of operated on that uh, assumption as well. So it's simply just apply CRDs and then kick off like a, a deployment that has the container for your yep. controller to run on. Yeah, and exactly. And like on OpenShift AI, on Open Data Hub, like you can enable that via the operators. It's even easier. Yeah, like um, within Open Data Hub, which is like, yeah, so like with that, you can just enable that. Yeah, my experience, I, I just deployed it today, but I just have to make sure that the BSC has, you know, Q is managed, and, and it starts automatically for me. So it's, it's really easy. It's, it's all the CRDs and everything in there. So it's easy. But I've always been a little bit confused about the resource flavor. I'm not quite sure. Like, yeah. Is it chocolate, or is it a size? <laughs> or I, I never quite understood that, uh, that particular item. Yeah, so, so the resource flavor um, is basically to allow you to uh, schedule workloads to a specific node. So in your actual uh, queue quotas, uh, you'll, you won't say like, I have this many of CPUs. You'll say, I have this many CPUs from this flavor. Uh, and each flavor will map to a node. Uh, when queue then goes uh, and decides uh, which resources to admit, uh, it will admit it to a specific flavor. Um, and then to the pods that it creates, it will add specific uh, node affinities, like uh, so, it's like selecting based off a, a label, uh, and it can also add like paint toleration uh, if if it's like a GPU uh, node. So it kind of gives you gives you that ability to map uh, your job uh, to a node without actually um, taking on the responsibility of placing the job on the node. So to maybe give a more concrete um, example of that, like you know what. Amazon, you have hundreds of types of nodes, right? And like you have like P5s or G4DN, whatever, right? So like um, I may allow some data scientists to use nodes which have really expensive A100 GPUs on them, right? And then I may have other you know, software engineers who are just like trying to learn data science. I don't want to give them the good stuff, right? Resource flavors make it easier for me to manage which teams, which people get access to what types of GPUs and nodes. Any other questions?